This is a special Q&A episode of the podcast, and I'm going to answer, well, quite a range of questions, including what caused the economic collapse of 2008? How do we stop Biden from destroying the country? Is fascism a force in the Russia-Ukraine war, and is this fascism on the left or on the right? How can conservatives create a parallel culture, especially in film, and how can young conservatives help with this effort? Why is the GOP so silent about January 6th? How should we respond to gender indoctrination in the workplace? And Debbie's going to join me. A curious listener wants to know the secret to our happy marriage. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. Times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. Time for our first question. Here we go. Hey, Dinesh. My name's Troy, and I live in Bloomington, Minnesota. Wrote to you earlier. Thank you for answering my first question. My second question was, we obviously all know that the gas prices and the inflation are Joe Biden's fault. They are a direct result of his energy policies, along with all the other blunders of his administration. Something that popped into my head earlier today, though, was I wanted to know why you think the 2008 economic collapse happened. Was that President Bush's fault or was that President Clinton's fault? Who do you think was at fault for that? God bless you and thank you for all you do. The 2008 crash began in the real estate sector and then reverberated more broadly through the uh, economy. It wasn't as bad as the crash of 1929. It didn't throw the country into a Great Depression, but it did create a recession um, that uh, cratered the economy. And and uh, it took uh, quite a while, uh, in fact, a few years to get out of it. Now, For the left and for the progressives, this reflected the greed of Wall Street bankers, the greed of the mortgage brokers and the real estate industry generally. And the solution, of course, was more government regulation. And more government regulation was, in fact, imposed uh, on the banks, on the financial sector, on Wall Street after the 2008 crash. But all of this missed the real cause of the crash. And to understand the cause cause of the crash, you've got to understand how bank lending practices changed in the years leading up to 2008. Now, it used to be that banks, in order to um, make real estate loans, and you know, I know about this very well. I've bought a number of houses over the years. My first house was a condo um, in Alexandria, Virginia. Then I bought my first sort of standalone house in the late 1980s, also in the Virginia area. Later, I bought in California. Now Debbie and I have a house in Texas. So we've seen the way in which all of this has developed over really the last few decades. Now, used to be, as I said, that when banks made a loan for a house, you'd have to put down a substantial down payment. And that's actually good for you and it's good for the bank. It's good for you, why? Because first of all, your loan amount is less, you have less to pay off, you have equity already in the house. Otherwise, when you move into the house and you're making payments, almost all that payment is interest. So you have almost no equity. You can go around saying you own your house, but the truth of it is the bank owns your house. But if you put a substantial down payment, it's fair to say you at least own that part of your house. Now, It was also good for the bank because the bank had a protection against non-payment of the loan. If for some reason you didn't pay, let's say you had a house for that's worth $200,000 or $300,000. Well, you've put a down payment of $20,000 or $40,000. And so the bank always knows we can always sell the house uh, and we'll be able to recover the loan payment. Now, here's the point that starting in the Clinton era, And continuing in the early uh, 2000s, the Democrats and the left began to put pressure on the banks to relax 
their lending standards. The justification for this was to make it possible for more Americans to own a home. Remember, real estate prices had gone up dramatically in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And so the idea was, why should only some people have advantage of the American dream? Let's make sure that more people, particularly lower income people and minorities. Remember, virtually every stupid thing that happens in public policy begins with the chant of low income people and minorities. And so the Democrats began and to badger the banks and badger Wall Street and say, basically, you don't need to put 20% down. If a house is going to go up in value, why don't you put 5% down or 1% or no down payment whatsoever? And a lot of these banks uh, began to recognize, well, listen, as long as we have federal insurance, as long as we have mechanisms to cover us, we don't care. We're happy to take no money down. In fact, ultimately, we'll make more money in interest that way. So the point I'm trying to get is what really happened that led to the 2008 crash is banks and real estate uh, industry generally began to take on very irresponsible lending practices, but they didn't do it on their own. See, normally, any industry is caught between greed and fear. They want to make more money on the one hand, but they're also afraid of losing money. So when Congress steps in and says, listen, we want to make it easy for you to make it available to all Americans to own a house, you don't need to have these stringent lending practices and we'll cover your losses if you go down. When banks begin to believe that, then they go, let's be irresponsible because there's no cost to our irresponsibility. That's really what happened. And sure enough, the banks proved to be correct. The moment that things went downhill, what does Congress do? What does the government do? Bail the banks out. Remember the old too big to fail. We got to we gotta bail out these banks. So all of this, I think, created a the two things really that the left wanted. On the one hand, greater government supervision of the whole financial sector. And the second is, let's blame the whole thing on capitalism so people become willing in other areas to succumb to greater government control. What do you have in your home? Do you have ordinary towels or do you have my pillow towels? If you have ordinary towels, it's time to switch out. Uh, why? Because ordinary towels just don't seem to dry you anymore. They feel soft and lotiony in the store, but you take them home and they don't absorb. Why not? Because ordinary towel companies typically import the product and they add softeners that make the towels feel good on the outside, but they don't dry you very well. Now, Mike Lindell, the CEO of MyPillow, has founded the best towel company right here in the USA. They have proprietary technology to create towels that feel soft, but actually work. They're all made with USA cotton. They come with the MyPillow 60-day money-back guarantee. These are the only towels we use in our home, and we love them. Now, for a limited time, Mike is offering a really good deal on his six-piece towel set, which includes two bath towels, two hand towels, two washcloths, all made with USA cotton, regularly $109.99, but now $39.99. Wow. Call 800-876-0227. That number, 800-876-0227. Or go to MyPillow.com to enjoy the offer. Get deep discounts, by the way, also on all the other MyPillow products. But you got to make sure to use promo code D-I-N-E-S-H, Dinesh. Here's our next question. Listen. Hey, Dinesh. How is the Biden administration getting by with selling out our country? And how do we stop it? This has got to be illegal. Please tell us how to do it so that we can get somebody in there to take care of it. <laughs> well, this is putting things in the simplest and starkest uh, form. And I wish I could um, provide a recipe and go, listen, you know, here's what we need. We just send in four guys with a stretcher, you know. But no, uh, we're, we're a little bit stuck with this guy. Now, this is not to say there aren't things that we can't do to limit him. And uh, but I think the the practical possibilities of, let's say, invoking the 25th Amendment. And let's remember, that's kind of going from the frying pan into the fire. You then get the cackling one. Ha -ha! You know, Kamala Harris comes in and things get even worse. You're like, please bring Biden back. Oh, with the, the good old days with Biden. <laughs> you know, so ju just when you think things couldn't get any worse, they sometimes do. Now, with Biden. There are things that can be done. First of all, the GOP needs to be more active in blocking him at every stage. Now, I can't say the GOP, the Republicans are doing a bad job. By and large, apart from the first infrastructure bill, we have stymied Biden, but we're a little too lenient in letting a lot of his nominees through, nominees to the Federal Reserve, ambassadors, various positions that the GOP can be more obstructionist than it is. And I advocate maximum obstructionism. In other words, let's think like Democrats. 
Number two, we need to work really hard to make sure Democrats lose both houses of Congress in the midterms. Now, none of this nonsense about, you know, I'm not going to vote. You must vote. And not only must you vote, you must use your influence. And remember, uh, I think in conjunction with all this, we need to be building media structures on our side so we can reach more people, reach more independents. Our media megaphones are smaller than the left's media megaphones. And one of the reasons that, so we're always playing within kind of an unlevel playing field. Their propaganda reaches tens of millions of Americans and our propaganda, if you will, I don't hesitate to call it that, if you will, uh, is, is, has a much more limited circumference and a more limited radius. So use the influence that you have, particularly with people who are sitting on the fence. Don't hesitate to bring up political issues. Don't hesitate to talk about what Biden is doing. Now, fortunately, the American people aren't really dumb. They're able to see what's going on. And there's a limit to how much you can you can divert them. So you can say until the cows come home, oh, gas prices are not due to Biden. They're really due to Putin. They're due to this and due to that. But the truth of it is gas prices were low under Trump and they're high now. Uh, and anyone with eyes to see and a little bit of a memory can remember that gas prices started going up before Putin invaded the Ukraine. It cannot be entirely attributed to that. So no matter how much the media does its kind of obliging chant, uh, it just takes a modicum of perception to be able to see they're actually uh, selling the Biden snake oil uh, and uh, we don't need to buy it. So I think independents are getting the message, but whatever we can do to italicize that point, to take people who don't normally think politically and put these things in context, uh, to help to dissipate the media propaganda, if you will, all very useful things to do. So if the GOP uses its influence and conservative media expands its reach and you use your influence, we'll be doing what we can to limit Biden's effectiveness over the next uh, election cycle. And then, of course, we want to root out the Democrats, not just from the Congress, but also from the presidency in 2024. When's the last time you looked at your mortgage? I mean, really looked at what you're paying. If it's been a while, you could be overpaying and not even know it. Don't let that happen. Interest rates are still incredibly low, which could mean hundreds of dollars in monthly savings for you. Do yourself a favor and make a 10-minute call to American Financing. Take advantage of a free mortgage review and see if they can save you up to $1,000 a month. That's right, a month. No pressure, no obligation, no upfront or hidden fees. Just a simple conversation around custom loans that may fit your budget better. And if you start now, you could close in as little as 10 days. Call 888-528-1219. That number again, 888-528-1219 or visit American AmericanFinancing.net, American Financing, NMLS 182334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. The next question is a written question and comes from George, and I'm going to read it. Um, I'm a big fan. You have a lot on your plate, George writes. But please revisit the left-right political spectrum. Today, we're getting bombarded with egregious misinformation that Nazis are right-wing. You successfully debunked this. Wikipedia says that both Nazis and fascists are far right. Couldn't be further from the truth. As you know, the world needs to be reminded that the left is big government, authoritarian, socialist, fascist, totalitarian, anti-individual. Putin is a leftist. Leftism is bad all bad actors, let's reinforce right-wing as pro-individual and pro-freedom. Now, all of this has kind of come back to the surface because of some discussion in Ukraine about uh, fascist uh, and even proto-Nazi groups operating in the Ukraine. Now, this is a little bit of an embarrassment uh, to the West um, and to the Biden administration because what, in, in supporting the Ukraine against Putin, are we sort of defending Nazis? Are we defending fascists? And, and these are groups, by the way, that identify, they, they call themselves fascist. Now, initially the media uh, kind of poo-pooed this idea that there were fascists uh, fighting on the Ukrainian side. But I think as people began to look a little more closely, they realized that, yeah, there actually is a fascist presence on the Zelenko side, on the Ukrainian side of this conflict. Here's an article in Salon that kind of gives you the picture just from the title itself. Are there really neo-Nazis fighting for Ukraine? Well, yes, but it's a long story. So this is Salon kind of breaking down and admitting that it is the truth. Now, 
uh, the article goes on to point out correctly that, quote, Putin didn't wage war to denazify the Ukraine. So that is sort of Russian propaganda. Well, just like in World War II, where we fought the Nazis, we're fighting the Nazis again, but this time in Ukraine. No, this is not actually a fight about that. But it is true sometimes that even on, if you can say, the good side, you have some bad guys. And But the question you're asking, George, is really which side of the political spectrum are these bad guys on? And this is the heart of the matter. In the, in the Salon article and on Wikipedia, Nazis, fascists are routinely described as right wing. Now, the question becomes right wing why? What is it about them that is causing these groups to be described as right wing? And typically, when you, when you look at the media descriptions, you realize that they're using right wing to mean two things, dictatorial or trying to establish some form of centralized authority, some kind of centralized, all-powerful state. And I think what George is saying, and he couldn't be more right, is first of all, dictators can be left-wing or right-wing. All you have to do is take a quick survey of dictators over the past 100 years uh, all over the world, and you realize that they span the entire spectrum. In fact, some of them are very hard to classify at all. Um, but from uh, Pinochet to Castro to um, um, the, um, uh, who was the guy in the Philippines? Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos, um, Ceausescu, the list goes on. You've got plenty of dictators who are on the left, and you've got some, I would say, Franco, for example, De Debbie mentions Hugo Chavez. Most of these guys are actually on the left. And by on the left, what I mean is they support the collectivist socialist ideology of the left, which, by the way, is the ideology of fascism. Now, Nazism is a socialist ideology with an important modification. It's basically fascism with the addition, with the added element of, uh, you can say, racial anti-Semitism. So Nazism uh, injected the race doctrine into fascism, and it created, as a result, a peculiar type of socialism. Now, interestingly, when you look at these right-wing brigades in the Ukraine, what do they support? They support a strong Ukrainian state. They support a centralized government. They are uh, in this sense, left authoritarian. Um, and what George is pointing out is that if you really draw a kind of a graph and you put uh, freedom on the one side and state control on the other, and then begin to locate people on this spectrum, uh, it becomes a very convenient way to distinguish the left from the right. By and large, the right is the party of freedom. By and large, the left is the party of state control. Now, as with any simple division like this, there are some kind of wrinkles or complications you want to introduce. It's not that the right is always opposed to any government control. The right is also the party of the decent society, the lawful society, the party of virtue, if you will. And sometimes in limited cases and within the reach of limited government, conservatives will support government action to outlaw extreme forms of pornography or outlaw certain forms of behavior that basically lower the tone of society. So I would say that that um, one can't uh, fully understand the left and the right only in terms of, liberta of, uh, of libertarian individualism versus state control, uh, but that is a generally accurate picture. Uh, and the history of fascism, the history of Nazism shows that these characters, the people who founded these ideologies and the people who subscribe to these ideologies to this day, come uniformly from the political left. If you could see and taste the steak or salmon from moinkbox.com, you would be ordering it right now. I'm kind of seeing it and tasting it in my mind. It's so delicious. I'm telling you, you got to get moinkbox.com. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and wild-caught Alaskan salmon direct to your door, helping family farms in the process become financially independent outside of big agriculture. Moink meat is so delicious. I love it, and you will too. Get moinked right now. Join the the Moink Movement today. Go to moinkbox.com slash Dinesh and listeners to this show will get free filet mignon for a year. What? That's one year of the best filet mignon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. It's spelled M-O-I-N-K, moinkbox.com slash Dinesh. That's moinkbox.com slash Dinesh. Our next question is a video question. Here we go. Hi from Massachusetts, Dinesh. 
I'm a huge fan of your work, a daily listener of your podcast, and I'm awaiting the release of 2,000 Mules. As Americans, we are undoubtedly living in a unique and unprecedented time. So many people who were independent, apolitical, or even those on the left are waking up to the liberty and truth that conservatism offers. As this move towards freedom grows, how can the growing amount of new conservatives, especially those in the younger generation such as I, foster critical thinking and strengthen moral resolve in a hostile environment? Furthermore, you've talked at length about the need for a parallel conservative culture to Hollywood. What would you say is the most important element that makes a work of music, story, or art conservative? Finally, with your experience as a filmmaker, what advice could you offer in navigating this emerging market? Thank you. Wow. Well, I detect sort of three questions, and I'm not sure if I'll do justice to all of them, but let me try to take them in sequence. Um, the first question has to do with young conservatives and learning about conservatism and what it means. And this is actually very important because this is not happening, you may say, in the natural course in our educational system. You can go through school and college and you're not even exposed to conservative ideas, so you don't have any idea of what it is. All you get are the derogatory labels of the left. Oh yeah, those people are extremists. Oh yeah, those people are racist. And you begin to think that's what conservatism is. This is complete nonsense. By and large, the way to understand any way of thinking, and this applies to liberalism, to progressivism, it applies to uh, really any system of thought, is you try to understand the ideas by exposing yourself to the people who advocate the ideas. You go, in a sense, to the advocates of those views themselves. If you want to understand Marxism, start with Marx. Uh, don't just look at derogatory descriptions of Marx. Listen to what Marx himself is saying and then try to learn to critically evaluate that. So there is a, a pantheon of conservative writers and thinkers that I think provide a good entry point to start thinking about conservatism at the basic level. And uh, and I almost think that today, if you're a young person and a student, you need your own little conservative library that uh, provides this kind of access. And so in economic thought, you'd have people like Milton Friedman, you'd have uh, Friedrich Hayek, you'd also want Whitaker Chambers, you'd want Solzhenitsyn. Uh, my own conservatism is a political conservatism, but it's embedded in a sort of historical and I would say philosophical uh, and even literary conservatism. And this kind of brings me to your next question, which is uh, what makes a particular work of art conservative? Now, this is a deeper question because here we're not just talking about conservatism in the sense of the Republican Party or, or winning an election. I would say that conservatism in this sense uh, is nothing more than a uh, an appreciation for the greatness of of tradition. Now, the reason we like tradition is not just because things are old and we really like old stuff. No, it's because what tradition does is it filters out the best through the long expanse of time. So in other words, think about it this way. How many people are alive today? What is the chance that, that let's just say, the 100 greatest books ever written would all be written, let's say, in the last 10 years? The answer is it's extremely unlikely. Typically, by and large, in an entire era, you're going to get two or three great scientists who really make advances. You're going to find probably one or two great American novels. Um, as we look at earlier centuries, we find that, you know, solitary figures or small groups of people kind of jump out. You survey the entire landscape, for example, of the 10th and 11th century, and all you get is a single figure, Anselm. I've been talking, of course, in my podcast about Dante, kind of a luminous figure, of the 13th and early 14th century. And uh, so what tradition does is it kind of goes through the kind of, through the debris of the past and out of all that rubble, it picks out, well, these are the guys who really count. These are the guys who've made real contributions uh, to uh, the fields of science and anthropology and history and literature. So these are the people that are, that, uh, are worth reading and studying. Why? Because they can make you even wiser than even wiser than experience can. Now, uh, there's a, a real benefit to coming at all this uh, as a young person because all of this is not 
um, the kind of crusty tradition handed down from generation to generation. Even if it was handed down that way, it hasn't been handed down to you. And so you're approaching it all with fresh eyes. And that's probably the best way to learn. You approach things with the same, you could almost call it childhood curiosity of a kid who looks out at the seashore and says things like, you know, how do we get the waves? Why do we have waves, dad? Uh, or you look up at the sky, why is it blue? Uh, you're asking elementary questions or elemental questions that go to the heart of the matter. And the quest for knowledge, I think, comes out of that sense of wonder. So conservatism at the educational level is nothing more than nourishing that quest for wonder, making sure it doesn't stop when you graduate from high school or stop when you graduate from, from college, but continues as a lifelong pursuit. Uh, and then that wisdom is applied not just to politics in the narrow sense, but to life in the broader sense. We all learn from a very young age about eating fruits and veggies. We learn this from our parents. We learn this from our science books. Our doctors tell it to us, but we often don't do it. And so Debbie and I have found a, a kind of a wonderful plan B that does the job. It's called balance of nature. So here's the deal. We've got a little cap bottle here that has three capsules. These are the fruits. And here's a green bottle for the veggies. We take three of these and three of these and we're done. And Debbie also swears by this. It's the balance of nature of fiber and spice. Debbie goes, this is what keeps me regularly regular. This is also what helps with my acid reflux. So this is really good stuff for your health. Invest in your health and your life. Join me and experience the balance of nature difference for yourself for years to come. For a limited time, all new preferred customers get an additional 35% discount and free shipping on your first balance of nature order. Use discount code AMERICA. Call 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code AMERICA. Here comes our next question. Here we go. Hi, Dinesh. I have a question for you. My question is, why are Republican politicians still afraid to speak out on what really happened in the riots on January 6th? This is a uh, question I've thought about because to me, it's very um, frustrating and even exasperating that the mainstream of the Republican Party continues to be largely silent on this issue. I suppose part of it is that Republicans have been, traditionally and even still are, the party of law and order. And so when you have a sort of violation of law, however minor, and in this case, I think largely symbolic, Republicans kind of go into their law and order mode um, which is sort of, let's hold them accountable, let's throw the book at them. Now, on top of this, you have the fact that uh, Republican lawmakers, many of them were in that building, and not only interpreted January 6th as a risk uh, to themselves, uh, but also a risk to the sort of process of government itself. And there is a solemnity to the um a process and a solemnity to the transfer of power. And um, so Republicans are like, we can't have, we have to have zero tolerance of anyone interfering with this kind of a process. So I think those are perhaps the two main factors. Don't you think, honey, uh, for why Republicans from the beginning have had a sort of lack of sympathy. Now, there might be a third factor, which is the fact that from the beginning, the left fully exploited this issue, um, trumpeted the rhetoric of insurrection. Obviously, Republicans want to stay away, partly out of fear, from being identified as domestic insurrectionists or being supportive of that kind of thing. And so part of it, I think, is Republicans running for the exits to avoid being lumped in with the January 6 protesters. There's a level of intimidation that's definitely the third factor. So put all those three factors together. Together. Now, I think what's working the other way that is actually causing the tide to shift, although it's, it's taken some time for it to shift and it continues to shift even now, is Republicans are beginning to realize that there is a massive, whopping Himalayan double standard involved. In other words, it's one thing to say, OK, disruption of a government proceeding needs to be punished. Well, Democrats disrupt, disrupt 
at numerous government proceedings and they haven't been subjected to anything like the same level of just being hunted down and Google searched and tr geo tracked uh, and, you know, put into solitary confinement and facing all these charges, even if all they did was walk into the hall and take a selfie. So the, the shocking double standard, which actually calls into question the whole operation of equal justice under the law in the country. Uh, this is something I think that Republicans are now waking up to. And they're waking up to the fact that, listen, if you allow the Democrats to do this, then they'll keep doing it to us. Uh, and we will just be on the receiving end. Every, every time there's an infraction, there'll be one set of penalties for Democrats, one set of penalties for Republicans. We will be living in a two-tier society and the two tiers will be defined politically. One party, in a sense, becomes on the receiving end and the other party is in a very literal sense, above the law, or at least above the application of the same law in the same way. So I think that they, that happily Republicans are waking up one by one to the fact that this whole January 6th operation, and by this I mean the Merrick Garland operation, and I also mean the January 6th commission, uh, these are... Um, these are hit jobs being mounted by the left against the right. Uh, they're not operations of justice. They're operations themselves of a certain kind of political terrorism. Aches and pains come to us all eventually, whether from the normal wear and tear of time or from injury. But now there's a 100% drug-free solution and it's called Relief Factor. Relief Factor supports your body's fight against inflammation and inflammation is the source of aches and pains. The vast majority of people who try Relief Factor order more. Why? Because it works for them. Debbie's a true believer in Relief Factor. It's been kind of a game changer in relieving the pain caused by her frozen shoulder. Debbie knows if she doesn't take it, regularly, the pain is going to come right back. So she's like, I'm not going to be without this again, because, you know, being able to exercise and lift her arms, super important to her. Relief Factor is the tool she needs. She's glad she's got it. You too can benefit. Try it for yourself. Order the three-week quick start for the discounted price of only $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246 to find out more about this offer. That number again, 833-690-7246 or go to relief factor.com. Feel the difference. Okay, let's take our next question. Hi, this is Cynthia. And I wanted to discuss an email that I received at work from my employer, state government. And the email starts like this. The theme of International Women's Day is break the bias. To reduce bias, we must retrain our brains by understanding bias and self-reflecting. Gender roles play a large part in the bias we have towards each other. We unconsciously equate men with careers and women with family. In the workplace, that assumption can be negative, can have negative effects on the equity between genders. In fact, the implicit association test found that 74% of survey participants, both men and women, associate men with careers and women with family. We must be intentional with our learning to see any change towards a more equitable workplace. And then the email goes on to show ways that we can retrain our brain. For example, understanding confirmation bias, the tendency to look for evidence we already believe is true. Dinesh, what are your thoughts and how should I respond to this email? Well, this is the kind of thing that government bureaucrats spend a lot of time on. Uh, they probably started this, you know, weeks ago. International Women's Day is coming up. It's time to write a memo. And, um, you know, I'm assuming the writing speed at the governmental level is probably something like one sentence a day. So it probably took them weeks to come up with this stuff. And it's all based upon, as far as I can tell, you can almost say refuting the 1950s view of the world, right, honey? I mean, this is, it's sort of the idea is that, uh, that after, yeah, at the end of ni the 1950s, you have those old ads of the kind of happy housewife at home. You, I got a new oven. Hi, honey, I got a new oven. And then the guy comes back and he's inevitably some kind of a goof. Oh, I smell some nice things cooking in the kitchen. Oh, don't forget the pearls. Oh, yeah, then there's, right. And, and, and of course, you know, look, there's a, even then it was obsolete. Even then this was a kind of, typically what happens is the images of advertising and popular culture themselves reflect an earlier era. So after the war, this is World War II, you have women coming into the workforce and then coming into the workforce in much larger numbers in the 1960s and of course continuing since then. 
And so here we are, you know, in 2022, <laughs> what, 70 years later, and we're still arguing about, you know, the America that, um, that was reflected in popular culture in the 1950s, which probably re reflected the reality of American life in the 1920s and 30s before World War II. So this is, this is rhetoric that's literally a hundred years old. Now, uh, the America that we live in today, um, is an America in which uh, people have choices and they know they do and people take it for granted. Um, and uh, young women know they can be lawyers if they want to. All they have to do is go to law school and do the work. Now, there are obviously issues that come up where people will say, well, listen, I kind of want to have kids. I don't really want to be at a law firm all my life. And so I'm going to go into a particular area of the law that allows me to have these kinds of breaks, if you will, so I can take time off and I can come back. But this is all within the realm of individual choice. And that's really the way it should be. So I don't think we need to retrain our brain. There are some realities about the workplace. There are also, by the way, uh, all kinds of differences in, in terms of people who choose particular professions. Um, you find certain professions that are dominated by men. You find other professions that are dominated by women. Uh, and there can be complex reasons for why people do make the choices they do. But we don't need to be able to go into that. Well, is it nature or is it nerd? What's the reason that you'd rather be a doctor or you'd rather be a poet rather than go to law school? We don't need to figure all that out. It's your choice. That's the point. And what's going on here is that in the name of kind of fighting bias, they're introducing bias. What they're doing is they're saying essentially, look, what we want you to do is become a kind of gender crusader. What we want you to do is join our social justice movement. What we want is a redistribution of power in the direction of greater supervised control. So all this kind of leftist agenda is masquerading as the solution to a problem that, as I say, maybe was once a problem in the quote, good old days, but is not really a problem that anyone can discern today. And it's, by the way, exactly the same as race. Look around yourself, people are like, what about white supremacy? And everywhere I see, you know, whites are like sycophantically like uh, responding to blacks. By and large, blacks can get away with far more than whites can in our society. There's no question if a black kid beats up a white kid, it's a fight. If a white kid beats up a black kid, oh, it's a racial incident. Oh, call in the cops. Oh, wait a minute. Make sure that this guy is suspended from school. His career is ruined. He's on the front page of the New York Times. So the truth of it is that that what the left is doing is a, uh, crusading against problems that are no longer problems, and B, very often creating race and gender division where it wasn't there previously, so they can then present themselves as the, um, as the uh, firefighters to extinguish a fire that they themselves have set. Imagine the lifelong impact of a journey to the Holy Land. Surrounded by like-minded travelers, picture yourself stepping foot in iconic locations right out of Scripture. Join Dr. Sebastian Gorka and Dinesh D'Souza on this life-enriching Israel tour, November 30th through December 9th, 2022. For more information, call 855-565-5519 or visit StandWithIsraelTour.com. The last question is kind of a twofer, by which I mean it's actually aimed at Debbie and me. And so here we go. D Dinesh and Debbie, we love how you interact on the podcast. <laughs> I recently discovered your work and was curious about your personal life. How long have you and Debbie been married? How many children do you have and what are their ages? And are they as conservative as the two of you? Mm. Oh, you want to start or me? You start. They want to know um, how long we've been married. And actually, tomorrow is our wedding anniversary. Our sixth year Six anniversary. Years. And so um, we're doing a little bit of a getaway. We don't get too many getaways these days, partly because we're so swamped with the, not just the podcast, but the film. Mm -hmm. So you and should tell everybody Monday, Monday, we will not be having a podcast because we will be on our getaway. Yeah, so we come back Monday and we'll be resume normal on Tuesday. So no podcast on on Monday. So yeah, Debbie and I, we've um, well, I guess we've known each other eight years and been married six, and we have. 
three children between us. I have one, uh, Danielle, who's been on the podcast. Uh, Debbie has two. Uh, Justin, uh, who uh, works in an architectural firm, and Juliana, who is in her um, who is in her senior year in college. Mm -hmm. And so they want to know if they're as conservative as the two of us. So, so you speak for Danielle. You, well, interestingly, yeah. I think we, we kind of have the, <laughs> with, with Danielle and Juliana, we have the extremes. So I'll talk about Danielle, who is, uh, well, Danielle wasn't conservative, uh, except in the sense of being uh, very serious about her faith when she went to college. And in fact, even when she was at Dartmouth, she wasn't very active with the Dartmouth Review. I think it's only toward the end of her college years that she saw the kind of intolerance of the left. Uh, and in fact, she was in a sorority. They were trying to throw her out because she had said one nice thing about Trump. And so she became really indignant. And now she has become, would you say, to the right of me, probably? Yeah, I would, I would <laughs> think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, she's very, very, very conservative. Um, and, uh, and then uh, my son, Justin, who is also... Uh, Danielle's age. Um, they're a month apart, two months apart. Mm -hmm. So he he will be twenty seven this this coming in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, he's very conservative, um, though he's he's not political in the sense like he's not out there, you know, like, like Danielle, you know, in the spotlight. But he's very very conservative. Well, I also like the his conservatism is is almost you can say in his bones because even sometimes when we'll yeah. offer to help him to do something, he's like, no, I don't need it, I don't want it. He's got this kind of fiercely independent streak, which, to be honest, you had when you were younger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. and um, yeah, he's a lot like me in that sense, for sure. Um, and, uh, and then and so, Juliana and 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 Juliana, uh, my youngest at A&M, uh, I have to say she's probably been indoctrinated. <laughs> well, Justin that. calls her uh, a communist, but I think yeah. that's an exaggeration. She's not a, she's not a communist. <laughs> But this this is this just reflects that for Justin, oh, no. once you get off the oh. reservation, there's no stopping point. Yes, yes. But but I think with Juliana, yeah. I don't even think that she is uh, re that she has reflected upon and and adopted a left wing ideology. I think we both know that's not the case. Right. Well, I I actually don't know that that's the case. I mean, she she does listen to TikTok. And she um, she gets a lot of her news that way. But well, what does that tell you? Uh, I mean, that tells yeah. me that she is in her canoe and we have a, a yeah. culture that is pulling you to the left. And if you want to keep your canoe in the middle yeah. of the stream. And, and it's so funny because I, I so want her to meet a young man, conservative, Christian at A&M. So any of you looking for a girlfriend... But honey, you have to Let you have know. to warn them right up front <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. That, well, that she has major veto power over these things, and yeah, her yeah. taste is um, a little bit know, more toward no, the bohemian. I'm not. I'm just. I was just going to say. No, no, we don't know what her taste is, but but I do know that she probably does not want to date someone like that. Someone that you know I think is good for her, but I guess. Well, not only know, that, I, I think she thinks that if someone's explicitly conservative. It's probably going to give her the reputation of being kind of, quote, with a right winger. Yeah. And, yeah, and, uh, I think and you know, it's so interesting because uh, Texas A&M for a long time had the reputation of being one of the most conservative state schools in the country. Mm -hmm. It probably, uh, it probably still, still is in terms of the yeah, student body. Yeah, I think so. Cause I but know not the professors. There are a lot of, right. And, and I think the professors, I think that's, you know, now I don't know how much she listens to professors because she's not, uh, you know, she doesn't really... Um, take, you know, a lot of political science or history courses uh, per se. So I don't know what the indoctrination, I don't know if it's other kids kind of influence her, influencing her or professors or what, I don't know. But I'm hoping this is just age related. Um, you know, she is 21. She'll be 22 next month. Um, and I don't know if it's also just not having a job and having her parents still taking care of her. Um, I don't know, to be honest, um, but it would be really nice if all our children were as conservative as we well, are. Well, <laughs> coming back to, uh, you know, our six years of marriage and uh, I, I think our uh, life is unusual in that we are kind of joined at the hip 24-7. Right. Yes, I mean, <laughs> with the exception of a few like lectures that I've given in the age of COVID, COVID yeah, when the I, germaphobe was like, mm, I'm I'm like, think nah, you, you, you go. better go. <laughs> you go but, but but yeah. for a long time, you tr pretty much travel with me everywhere. And then, of course, we work 
together. You, Debbie produces the podcast. Uh, pretty much even in my writing, I mean, I'll dash off a chapter. I'm like, we do the I hand you the, together. and then we do the movies together. And you're in the movies and and uh, and and active in all aspects of the mm-hmm. movies. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of fun. We have we have in that sense a mm-hmm. um, a relationship that is not traditional in the sense that we're not sort of like I'm not a cardiologist married to someone who's like a homemaker, but rather we're we both. Are you saying I'm not a homemaker? Is that what I hear? No, you're actually a very actually, good homemaker. Actually, I've started becoming one. I really never was one, and now um, I've been cooking a little more. And, uh, well, you don't like going to restaurants in, I, this, I, uh, I actually, in this environment. I, I got to admit, I, I really, once they said, you know, rest, that, that COVID sp- is spread at restaurants, I'm like, okay, no, I'm not going. <laughs> so, but as a result, we do, yeah, we actually eat a lot more at home these we days. We do, but I think it's, it's also healthier yeah. for us. And, yeah. you know, we are getting up in age. I mean, oh, <laughs> oh, and uh, and so we need to be careful. You know, we need to make sure that our sugar it, is not elevated. Although, you know, well, we're a little health conscious, as I think people, you know, generally need, need to be. But no, yeah. we're um, but, we're really excited about completing six years with a lo- hopefully many, many more to go. Yeah, yeah. and um, and we have really discovered, I think, a real um, new happiness in our marriage, and we are. Um, I think more in love than we were Aww. even six years ago. <laughs> I love you, honey. I love you too. <laughs> Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.